Hello, chillers. Once again, Tuesday has come around. I'm Amber, and this is another episode of True Crime and Chill. Alex is out again this week, but I can finally reveal why she's been gone. She had a baby. He's charming, and both mom and baby are doing great. Tired, but great. So she's on maternity leave. We hope to have her back just as soon as she's able. If you pop over to our Facebook group, you can not only take a glimpse of the adorable little guy, but you can send over your congratulations to Alex. This week, I decided I wanted to cover a case that had lots of twists and turns, So while doing my research, I stumbled across this one and I kept finding myself going, what? What? So I just had to share it with all of you. So I've got my wine and I've got my case notes. So let's get started. This week, I'm sharing with you the tragic story of Sharon Marshall. Sharon Marshall was a high school girl whose life seemed almost too good to be true. She had an incredible opportunity and she never even ended up using it. A teenager with everything going for her? Yeah, sounds like something from a dream. Until you hear how this story ends, of course. She was reportedly a lieutenant colonel in the ROTC and one of the best and brightest students in her class. To the point where when she graduated from high school in 1986 from Forest Park, Georgia, Sharon had earned a full ride scholarship to the Georgia Institute of Technology with a plan to study aerospace engineering to fulfill her dream of working at NASA. However, Sharon never attended college or even utilized her scholarship as she was hiding a big secret. As it turns out, she was pregnant. And that was all during the final months of high school from her boyfriend, and she never even told him about the baby. Apparently, at one point, she tried to run away with her boyfriend, though it wasn't successful. Sharon hid her secret incredibly well. She ended up giving birth and giving the baby up for adoption to a wealthy couple from Texas. After losing her chance to attend college, Sharon moved to Tampa, Florida for a new start with a man named Franklin Delano Floyd. Even though she had moved there with him, she started to date another man and became pregnant a second time. She decided to keep this pregnancy a secret as well. However, this time she chose to keep the child and raise it with Frank. Sharon gave birth to her son, Michael Gregory Marshall, in 1988. Now, though there was certainly a relationship between Frank and Sharon. For a long time, it wasn't clear if the relationship was romantic or not. In any case, they did live together and they worked together to raise Sharon's son, Michael. In order to provide, Frank worked as a painter, but like many people I know, he frequently suffered from back pain, so he wasn't often able to work. So they started to receive welfare checks and relied on those. Sharon also became an exotic dancer to provide for the family. Sharon's co-workers described her as kind and friendly. She began a close friendship with an 18-year-old co-worker named Cheryl Camessa. Now, even though the girls were friends, Frank and Cheryl did not seem to get along, though there are reports that they possibly had a short affair. I imagine it was a, wait, do I actually hate you or am I attracted to you situation? Turns out they just hated each other. So the three of them went on an away weekend for a boating trip where Frank and Cheryl began to argue. After the argument, Cheryl allegedly reported Sharon to social services for misrepresenting her real and full income as a stripper. (laughs) So Sharon had secretly been hiding some of the money she made so the family could continue to receive checks from the government. After being reported, Sharon obviously no longer qualified for welfare. And Frank, he was furious. So he went to the club where the women both worked and he confronted Cheryl outside. Witnesses reported that Frank actually punched Cheryl in the face during the argument. Shortly after the incident, Cheryl decided to travel out of town to stay with a friend. I imagine it was her trying to escape the drama. (laughs) That's something I might have done in that situation when I was younger. However, her father became concerned when she didn't call to let him know that she made it safely to her friend's house. So, out of concern, he reported her missing. When they started searching, Cheryl's abandoned Corvette was discovered at the airport, and so a full investigation ensued to find her. Now, obviously, since this happened right after Frank punched the woman outside the club, 
Both Frank and Sharon were persons of interest. However, no evidence was uncovered to prove they had anything to do with it. But right after Cheryl's disappearance, Sharon and Frank quickly packed up and left the area and started using different names and aliases on the road. (laughs) Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. (laughs) That same year, 1989, Frank and Sharon got married. Frank's story was that it was to give Sharon's child, Michael, his family name, even though they were going by different names uh, all the time at this point. The three of them finally settled in Tulsa, Oklahoma. While there, Sharon got another job as, drumroll please, an exotic dancer. Sharon was known to be an outgoing person who easily made friends anywhere that she was. At the opposite end of the spectrum, there was Frank. Frank was not great at making friends and no one seemed to like him. People said he was aggressive and unpleasant. Reportedly, Frank got into another fight with another one of Sharon's new co-workers. Hmm. Now, I don't know if he just really disliked strippers, or maybe he really liked them and that was his way of showing it. In any case, there's clearly a pattern here. This particular dancer, however, made a scene. She screamed out that Sharon should leave him. And his reply was, and I quote, If she ever left me, I'd kill the bitch. Now, what Frank didn't know was that Sharon had been planning to leave and run off with another man she'd met at the club she worked at in Tulsa. It's said that she would have left sooner, but she was afraid of what Frank might do to her or her son. I imagine this is why she waited until she had a man to support her, probably more for protection than anything else. Before she could leave, though, Sharon was mysteriously the victim of a sudden accident. (laughs) She was found unconscious along the highway appearing as though she had been a hit-and-run victim. And Frank's alibi? He was asleep at the time of the accident. Sharon was rushed to the hospital, and her friends from work would come to visit her, and they reportedly felt positive about her recovery as she appeared to be getting better. However, in true Frank fashion, he stopped the hospital from allowing visitors to see her anymore. No reasons, just she wasn't allowed to have any visitors anymore. Five days after the hit-and-run, Sharon died. They claimed it was from her injuries, but many of Sharon's friends were suspicious of Frank because, you know, he was such a bright and cheerful, happy person. Her friends, as I said before, had reported she had appeared to be recovering and then she just suddenly died. However, apparently the doctor was also suspicious. He noticed old bruises she had that seemed to be the result of potential abuse. So he classified her death as a homicide and said that the head injury that put her in the hospital to begin with might not have been caused by a vehicle at all. My opinion, he killed her because she was getting better and he was afraid she was going to remember that he had put her in the hospital to begin with. Also that she was probably going to report him and then also leave him. He clearly couldn't have that. But of course, no one could prove that Frank had anything to do with Sharon's injuries or her death. To top it all off, Sharon's co-worker friends paid for her headstone, not her husband. Hmm, dun dun dun. After a short period of time, Frank contacted the life insurance company where he had placed a policy on Sharon just a few months before her death. Don't be suspicious, don't be suspicious. Fun story. The fact that Frank had so many aliases finally came to bite him in the ass. He couldn't remember which name and social security number he had used to take out his policy on Sharon. So he finally gave in and gave his real name and social security number to the insurance company. And that's when something amazing happened. All of his dirty laundry started to get aired out. Turns out he had a criminal history. For instance, when Frank was 19 in 1962, He was convicted of abducting and assaulting a four-year-old girl. He was sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison. Frank escaped the mental hospital where he was serving the beginning of his sentence by stealing a car and making a run for it. The day after he escaped, he robbed a bank. He didn't get away from that, though, and he was arrested again, only to be finally released in 1972. Almost immediately, he tried to abduct a woman from a gas station, which got him arrested again. This time was different, though. He posted bail and then made a run for it, skipping his court date. Of course, a federal warrant was put out, but he disappeared as he started using fake names. 
until he had to give his real name to try and collect on Sharon's life insurance policy. Now, just a quick side note here. If he was 19 in 1962, this would mean he was born in 1943. This means he was 46 when he married Sharon, who was just 19 in 1989. After being discovered, of course, he ran for it again. He didn't make it too far, though. He was picked up in Georgia and put in prison to finish the sentence he was supposed to carry out in 1972. Now, before Frank was on the run, he reportedly gave Michael to social services and he was put into the foster care system. He was put with what was reported to be a loving family, but the boy exhibited shocking behavior. He appeared to be nonverbal and he would scream and moan <laughs> to communicate. Because Frank insisted he was the father, they frequently brought Michael to visit him in prison. However, despite being nonverbal, Michael seemed to appear hesitant to visit Frank. It raised alarms, and so they carried out an official DNA test, even though Frank was resistant. The DNA test proved that Frank was not Michael's biological father, and they stopped allowing Frank the visits. Now, I wish I could say this is where the story ends, but it doesn't. After serving just four years, in September of 1994, Frank was released from prison. When he was released, he started stalking Michael and his foster family in Oklahoma. On September 12, 1994, Frank showed up at Michael's elementary school and asked to see the principal, James Davis. He demanded he be allowed to take Michael, and when they refused, Frank pulled out a gun. Without alerting anyone at the school, Michael was collected and, still at gunpoint, Frank insisted the principal drive them to an area just a few miles from the school. When they arrived, Frank tied the principal to a tree and left him there while he made his escape with Michael in the principal's truck. When the report was finally made, the police knew Michael was in danger, and they began an aggressive search. However, after two months of searching, Frank was discovered in Louisville, Kentucky, and was arrested with no sign of Michael. No signs, no trace, nothing. Michael just vanished. Frank refused to say anything about it, saying only, it's none of your business where he is, nor do I care how much any of you in Oklahoma miss him or love him. Which, you know, really shed some positive vibes on the whole thing. Frank went on trial for the abduction of Michael in 1995. Also in 1995, a mechanic purchased a truck at an auction. Inside, he discovered a large envelope with 97 photographs showing a woman who was beaten and bound. As it turns out, the truck had once been in possession of one Frank Floyd. He had stolen it while he was passing through on the run. And guess what, Frank? You forgot something. A few months before this purchase was made, skeletal remains were discovered in Pinellas County, Florida. DNA testing wasn't what it is now back in 1995, so for months they had no leads. The remains showed signs of being beaten and shot twice in the head. The photos that were discovered in the truck were compared to the remains, and a wound that was on the woman's cheekbone in one of the photographs matched one on the recovered remains. It was soon revealed that the remains were Cheryl Comesso. This all happened while Frank was on trial for kidnapping Michael, who still hadn't been found. He was found guilty and sentenced to 52 years in prison. He then went on trial for the murder of Cheryl Comesso. He was found guilty of that and sentenced to the death penalty. So let's go back to those photos, though, because the photos in the envelope weren't just of Cheryl being beaten and bound. Brace yourself, because this case is about to get weirder. The photos also showed Frank assaulting a young girl. But these were much older photos. So they began searching for the identity of the girl. It took until 2014 for the answers to come to light. But to go forward, we have to go back a little way again. So while Frank was on the run after posting bail and failing to appear in court for his attempted abduction, he got married in the mid-1970s to a woman named Sandy Chipman at a truck stop. <laughs> at the time, he was calling himself Brandon Williams, so of course she had no idea who he really was. Sandy was the mother of four children and had a criminal history of her own. She was caught passing bad checks and was arrested and sent to prison for 30 days. When she was released, she got home and discovered her house was empty and her children were gone. Sandy spent years tracking down her children. 
She found two of her daughters living with a social services group. Years later, she discovered her only son as an adult had been put up for adoption as a kid. He had a DNA test done and it came out that he was related to Sandy. However, she couldn't seem to find her oldest daughter, Suzanne. As it turns out, Frank's deceased wife, Sharon Marshall's real name, was Suzanne Marie Savarkas, and she was the daughter of Sandy Chipman. What? I know. Frank had taken Sandy's children and split them up in different social services groups, but decided to keep and raise Suzanne as his own daughter. They moved all across the country frequently. He told a lot of different stories, but the most common one was that she was abandoned by her parents, so he took her in and came to care for her. And as she was growing up, he started calling her Tanya Hughes. So just to recap, in case you missed it, Suzanne was kidnapped by her own stepfather, who raised her, frequently assaulted her, married her, possibly killed her, and kidnapped her son after she died. Sadly, in 2014, Frank finally admitted to killing Michael by shooting him while he was on the run. He says he hid the body alongside Interstate 35. However, remains have yet to be found. Police speculate that wild hogs might have eaten the boy's body. And if you're a real fan of true crime, you know that pigs eat bones. They just can't digest the teeth. So I suppose it's a possibility. And do I believe that? Maybe. I mean, it sounds like it was all about control for Frank, and that would certainly give him the final say. However, it also wouldn't surprise me if he just said that to make them stop searching for Michael and he put him in foster care somehow. And if Michael was still alive, he would be 33 today. Frank was never found guilty of Sharon's death. To this day, he still won't talk about it and he is still waiting on death row to pay for the death of Cheryl Camesso. We may never know the truth about the deaths of Suzanne Marie Sabarkis or Michael Gregory Marshall. All we can do at this time is assume and speculate until Frank Floyd tells the truth. And who knows how long that can be. Thank you for listening to True Crime and Chill. For more information, including case notes, photos, and sources, please visit our website at truecrimeandchill.com. You can also stay connected with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Look for new episodes from us each week on Tuesday.